Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Hyperledger Foundation Healthcare Special Interest Group. Uh, today, we'll be going over, as usual, some industry news articles, uh, some interesting projects we'll be talking about as well. And yeah, I just want to make sure everybody listening in on YouTube uh, is, I just want to make sure everybody on YouTube knows that this is something that we can continue and have discussions offline as well. So if you found something interesting in the video, please leave a comment, make sure you follow, subscribe, and um, yeah, let's get started. So before we get into the news articles, I just want to remind everybody about some interesting events happening uh, or have happened actually. So the Block Health Summit has happened or is happening now in Dubai. Uh, so that's an interesting event with some blockchain healthcare companies sponsored by Patientory. Um, October 16th through the 18th in Berlin, there's a World Health Summit. It's also online. So you can check that out as well. Got some interesting speakers from all over the world that are attending there. Uh, so please do check that out if you're in Berlin. October 24th through the 26th, Boston is having their MedTech conference as well. Uh, and as a reminder, this agenda is publicly available. You can go in to the site and view all uh, these links as well and previous meeting notes. November 13th through the 16th in Las Vegas, the health event will be happening. Uh, so that's always a big, big splash event. All right. So getting into the industry news here today. First is Google Cloud and Coinbase are actually forming a strategic partnership, which I found very interesting uh, because as you all know, you know, Coinbase, one of the largest exchanges for crypto and Google Cloud, obviously everybody knows how large they are. Uh, this sort of brings some, you know, I guess comfort in the Web2 folks who maybe not have believed in blockchain yet. So this is very, very interesting. It says here, as part of the partnership, Google Cloud is positioned to enable select customers, starting with those in the Web3 ecosystem, to pay for its cloud services with uh, via select cryptocurrencies. Powered by Coinbase Commerce, which enables merchants globally to accept cryptocurrency payments in a decentralized way. The new payments experience will benefit Google Cloud's customers and partners by increasing the optionality of payments for Google Cloud services. So we'll see how this unfolds and, to, and we'll also see if people actually will use their crypto to be paying uh, for these services on Google Cloud. Um, this, I think it's, yeah. Yeah, I was just Erica. curious, who else? I, I, I don't know enough about this, but um, is are the other partners with Coinbase like PayPal or do they use a different way of paying with crypto? Yeah, that's a good question. I think PayPal actually uses, um, do they use Block or something? I think I could be wrong there. No, Block is its own company, but PayPal, crypto, <laughs> services <laughs> yeah, on the on the spot searching here i think they have their own rails i don't even think they partnered yeah, with anybody i was curious who else part who else in the past has partnered with coinbase to do this or if this is like the first one um since they've had so much uh turmoil you know right paypal is finally allowing users yeah i don't know if they actually have any so paypal crypto partner paxos so they are partnered with Paxos, which is a large financial services uh, company. Interesting. Um, yeah, that's a good question. I'm not going to dig into that right now, yeah, but just curious thanks if for your hand. Yeah, it's a good question. If anyone in the listening knows, please leave a comment. And by the way, that's uh, Erica Bierbauer. She's uh, my co-chair and um, very knowledgeable in the space as well. So thanks for being here with us today, Erica. Thanks going to jump into the next article I found, and this was a pretty short article about recommendations for marketers in the Web3 healthcare space. So they discuss, um, you know, how to define Web3 and metaverse and understanding its possibilities for key healthcare constituents, and then what does it actually mean for them? And they effectively say it's the next version of the internet, one that will take advantage of AI, augmented reality virtual reality, and increasingly connectivity uh, like 5G to create online environments that are more immersive, experimental, and interactive than we than what we have today. 
but then it goes on to specifically say how when you're you know communicating this to a different audience you have to really tailor that experience so if you're talking to a provider you should really consider a provider's um, interests and user experience really a payer or a patient and the same goes for you know pharmaceutical and biotech companies and digital therapeutics in web3 so i'm not going to go into everything here but you know the final message here for today's marketer is that you know as you begin on as you begin to embark on this journey to the center of the metaverse consider the following uh, healthcare organizations and their marketing communications teams may need to engage audiences in these di new digital environments not too far into the future, understanding how product placements work inside this landscape and how to build trust and awareness under new sets of protocols will be critical. Um, so organizations can put their toe in the water and take a phased approach and focus on preparedness and familiarization with broader trends that stand to impact care. So if you want to read more on this article, it's in here. Did you have any uh, thoughts on that one? Yeah, I'm, I'm curious what they mean by um, having different, uh, you know, different different platforms or audiences for the pro provider, or payer, or patient, just because we're trying to get into transparency. So I would think that they would want more to be visible from each of these standpoints. Um, so I'm curious what they, uh, what that looks like, but I guess we'll see. Yeah. And again, like, the marketing for Web3 and Metaverse is still so pretty new, uh, and I'm sure things will change month to month, you, you know, year to year. Um, yeah. So it'll and be I think, interesting. Yeah, I think they'll have to keep things pretty separate until um, we can build some more transparency around, like, you know, pricing for patients and access to data for patients on the, on the provider side. So it'll, yeah, it'll be interesting to see how siloed that is. That's true. Uh, next up here um, from Farm Exec Journal, NFTs, what this new kid on the block means for healthcare. And uh, these two authors discuss what an NFT could mean for healthcare and if it could upend the existing industry. Uh, talks about how individuals generate hundreds of megabytes of data each year from imaging records, health apps, fitness trackers, and beyond, yet patients aren't involved or consulted when their information is used. Uh, the most striking example comes from the story of Henrietta Lacks and her amazing HeLa cells, which we probably all have heard of. Um, so this goes on to talk about how NFTs can hold this ability for patients to own their digital health assets and um, also provide some key considerations like the environmental impact of NFTs. I don't know if I really think that this article captures the true potential for nfts or, or the true understanding of nfts but um i think it's a good explainer article for a lot of people who are still learning about this for the first time so yeah check this article out it talks about you know what nfts are and things like that but yeah and we still haven't seen nfts like being implemented on a large scale in production um from any really major huge health system yet so or health plan so this is still something that people are thinking about and working on ways to address it with the mass public uh, one last just thing here at the end what can healthcare brands do now as the interest in nft grows so will opportunities it may be a while before nfts make sense for many brands but understanding this new technology is the first step in preparing for a future where NFTs and the blockchain offer meaningful or offer meaning and value to the healthcare sector. So, uh, yeah. So Kristen Ryan is executive vice president of U S head, U S head of digital innovation and the other author, Liana Hooper is vice president of digital at GCI health. Yeah. Any thoughts on this one? NFTs? Yeah. I just, I feel like um, healthcare again will be sort of the last adoption of, of it once it really is shown to be proven in other use cases. I just, you know, shown to be utilized more in other industries and then 
and then healthcare will sort of be because I mean the, the data is so different, you know, that it will be, that it will represent compared with other industries. So sure. I'm we'll, I'm with you. I think we away. <laughs> I think uh us uh, you know, Erica, us being in healthcare, it's kind of interesting because we know how long it takes for healthcare companies to adopt new technology in general. So we see the long term viability of this, but we also know that it's long term. Um, so it's kind of interesting because maybe people outside of healthcare might be super excited about this, but maybe in over their heads on, you know, when this will actually happen, but I'm glad we can share a little perspective. Mm -hmm. Um, and if you, anyone listening has any other thoughts, happy to read those in the comments below. Next up is this New York times article, which was really huge and it, recently came out oh can't view it here but let me try to open it in a different browser no so i'm not able to open this article but in any case what this exposed was that major insurance companies including like united health group humana and others have been taking advantage of medicare advantage plans. Uh, so this is a government funded health plan. And it looks like many large insurers were sort of charging the government for services, activities, products that maybe those patients didn't necessarily need. Um, I'm not going to go into the details here, but this is definitely going to be a huge story for a while, I think, and kind of shows the lack of transparency in the industry. And um, yeah, any thoughts, Erica, on this one? Yeah, I'm sure this goes on. Uh, this has gone on before and they just got caught. <laughs> yeah, and I feel like the penalties that they'll have to pay is, is probably worth what they did. Um, and that's just how it kind of goes because it's a systematic or systemic issue. Um, yeah, I mean, when you're in a fee-for-service system, you know, it's like the more services you get, the more you, <laughs> you get money for. So it makes sense that they're doing that. Exactly. Although I don't know if any other, any other healthcare systems work any better based on what I've seen from other countries too. So still oh. a good way to do it. You're absolutely right. So that's a good point. Sure, like this is a big deal here in the US, but I find it, hard to believe that other countries aren't doing the same thing. Um, so maybe even worse. So I'm glad that we've been able to expose it and hopefully it'll create more transparency on how, how this all works from healthcare uh, plans to, to the government. Biopharma trend, the promise of DAOs and drug discovery. So this was published a few days ago and it talks about how, you know, Pfizer, announced it would want to join Vita Dow and um, propose a half a million dollar bid for being part of Vita Dow and sort of just talks about how DAOs operate in some detail. Um, so you can see this flow chart. I'm it's really curious what their incentive is to do this because it's, it's almost like the, I feel like part of the incentive for Pfizer to join this is just to have the the, the press, you know, and the the exposure to it, but I'm wondering really what they want to do to be involved in something like this since they do want to keep everything so private that they do. So I don't know. It's yeah, it is interesting. And you make a good point Like in general, those um, large pharma companies, um, you know, I wouldn't expect them to join something like this, but I think their goal and what they said in their proposal was that they wanted to one, allow these early stage research projects and grants they want to allow them to happen and unfold. Uh, so they want to support those early researchers, but in a way that doesn't really involve them much at all. So it's kind of like they're sitting on the sidelines. But in the case where there are some researchers or some IP that is generated, they would be able to get access to that deal flow. So it gives them sort of like a, a VIP ticket into investing in these companies later on. Um, so it's all about, I think, access to those early stage research, uh, mm -hmm. companies. And then also, um, like you said, maybe just to show that they 
are still innovating and they're not like falling behind uh, as a big pharma company. Um, yeah, and it goes into some other DAOs as well. So you have Genomes DAO, it's based in the UK and it's positioned to be a direct to consumer genome sequencing company like 23andMe, LabDAO, which is a network of scientists and engineers designed to let researchers share their tools and services on a global marketplace and receive payments and tokens or shared IP. Uh, CureDAO, open source platform geared towards researching the effects of food, drugs, and supplements on human health. I think this one's a really interesting one. Uh, BioDAO looking to create an alternative for funding early stage biotech research and drug development projects uh, in a decentralized way. So yeah, I just thought oh. this was interesting. Yeah, I didn't know about the food one. That's really interesting. Supplement and food. Seriously, because like if you think about how many supplements are out there that people are taking and none of them are approved verified by the fda at all but the industry is huge and people are pushing it like crazy even like you know people like dr oz and, and others mm -hmm. that are supposed to be doctors and you know not necessarily pushing these supplements that don't have approval um i would like to know which which supplements work and which don't and for who so yeah, and like with the move towards real world evidence and actual methods of gathering this data in meaningful ways, I think it's this becomes even more important to have a way to gather as much information as we can and utilize it in good ways instead of, you know, all the studies that are out there that have so many confounding factors, we don't even know what's really, you know, helping people. Um, so I think it's a good timing for all that stuff. Agreed. Yeah, totally agreed. Uh... Next up here, we have the, not related to blockchain, but there was a massive digital library released um, to help with clinical trial researchers. Uh, this was in four in many other places as well. So pause this. You're, Ray, you're breaking up just a little bit. Oh, sorry. Okay, just want to let you know. Yeah, I appreciate that. Can you hear me now? Yep, better. Cool. Uh, that's interesting. So this was published uh, recently, and it was by a health technology startup called Human First, and they're changing the way clinical trials are being run. Uh, the company already works with many leading pharma companies and CROs through their Atlas Pro offering, which is the industry's most comprehensive library of digital measures and technology and has just released a new platform called Atlas EDU, designed to give qualified academic researchers access to their comprehensive library for free, free of charge. So this is a pretty big deal for the clinical research community. Um, Andy Karavos is the uh, leader of that group, of that company, and um, she leads Human First, I believe, and What's interesting is, you know, this can impact a lot of academic researchers now immediately. So even here, uh, Dr. Amy Abernathy and the FDA commissioner uh, have previously pointed out how the industry needs to needs the industry needs improvement and describe the needs for a learning health system that is based on incorporating data from personal technology such as smartphones and watches, understanding treatment impact on outcomes and being able to identify improvements in care. So I'm really excited to see what people come up with using this library of information. Um, if I click on the Atlas EDU link here, it might be helpful to see what that looks like really quick. So this is what it looks like. And you can search in a really cool way, like, you know, activity. So I haven't created a free account, but you can, sort of see the idea here. So there's 2,000 different products that are cataloged in this platform, 10,000 different measures, over 750 medical conditions, and 6,000 pieces of evidence. So they put these all together, and it really helps streamline research for, um, for clinical research. That's cool. Yeah. Next here, Pharma Voice. The digital therapeutics revolution is happening, and why... Big Pharma is buying in, although they say with caution. So we've seen you know, in the past few years, 
big companies like Pfizer, Novartis, Sanofi, BMS, um, they're all really pushing their digital therapeutics uh, space or group. And they're doing this in a way that's very measured and, you know, conscious. They're not kind of just jumping all in. Uh, and I think in the article, it says, you know, the definition of digital therapeutics is somewhat fragmented, which is kind of true because you have apps that are could be digital therapeutics and you have maybe some sort of devices that include digital aspects. Uh, and it can also be considered a therapy as well. And um, here it says, for much of pharma, one of the driving forces behind the adoption of digital therapeutics is remote patient monitoring, which allows for insights throughout the drug development life cycle. Um, and they all talk about how big pharma's approach is, you know, the biggest pharmaceutical companies in the world now have digital teams exploring potential of digital therapeutics where they fit into the more traditional paradigm of making and selling drugs. Here it says there's a conviction on the pharma side that yes, this is something that truly can benefit patients and actually effectively combine with a drug strategy. So I think their approach is interesting uh, and it's good that, you know, I think just having this article here creates more acceptance for digital therapeutics because I know five or 10 years ago, it was not as accepting as a, as a potential use um, or device or sort of rather app, I guess. Um, but the industry has grown tremendously over the last five, 10 years, and they've been able to prove the efficacy through clinical trials. So I think that has really helped as well. Um, yeah, I was going to say, I know they've used it in clinical trials um, for certain indications that make sense. Um, so, and it's good for monitoring and things like that too. Sure. There's, there's like a feedback loop that's enabled between patients and either their providers or even the pharma companies in some cases, if, mm -hmm. if, con if consent is shared or provided. Yeah. I think it's a really accurate way of doing things in some cases, depending on what you're measuring, but yeah, it's, it seems like it would be embraced and as you know, starting with certain use cases and then or indications and then going from there. Totally. Yeah, here it says, uh, pharma is very good at making drugs, selling drugs and making money from it. So oftentimes what we're seeing internally is that we need to show that we're solving some unmet primary medical need. So that's something that they are trying to do to capture the value from digital therapeutics. Mm -hmm. That's a good article. Um, next, not really related to healthcare necessarily, but more about blockchain and how there's been another sort of issue unveiled about uh, from Celsius. And, you know, as we know, Celsius was had some major issues, lost a lot of their capital earlier this year, and they became bankrupt. And in order to go through regulatory I know proceedings, they had to share a lot of information about the company and some details about their customers as well. So last week, more than 29,000 pages of court documents um, was sent and it revealed the financial details of hundreds of thousands of users, Celsius users, that kept money on the, the neobank Celsius. So obviously a lot of people aren't happy that they were doxxed there. Potentially, I think their, um, I don't know if their names were revealed, but yeah, names were shared. I think like financial information, probably uh, some other details, email address and things like that were most likely shared here. Uh, and yeah, it's, it's going to be a big issue for a while, I think, um, especially because you know, if you think about it, many of these people's names that were listed may have been heavily involved with cryptocurrency. So now that it's public information, they could be targets to hackers, yeah. et cetera. So yeah, this happened with Ledger a few years ago. Yeah, I recall that with Ledger. I think with <laughs> I was Ledger. One of the people, so I know. Oh, really? That's I yeah, think with I, Ledger. Yeah, I yeah, I was I was certainly targeted. <laughs> oh, well, I hope nothing happened 
from your experience? Yeah, I did. I, yeah, I had something happen, but it wasn't a major thing. So oh, wow. it wasn't too major, but it was my own. In the end, it was really my own fault. I just, it's hard when you're out of the space for a long time, you forget. Um, I think everyone has had this experience where you forget about, you know, um, all of the fishing. And so it just, yeah, I, luckily it wasn't a major thing, a major loss for me, but yeah, this is, I, it definitely hits close to home when I see stuff like this. For sure. Yeah. I'm glad nothing too serious happened, uh, in your case. Uh, but yeah, I'm sure people are trying to figure out how to make sure their accounts or their information or their wallets are secure. And I think for the ledger, it was like a, the database, the marketing side of the database or like their sales database was revealed. Mm -hmm. um, well, I think it was like any time that you had signed up at all to buy one, you put in your name, your address, your phone number, your email address, all that information was, was leaked. Yeah. So yeah. anybody who had ever bought one. And so, as you said, it's like these people, especially if you have a hard wallet, usually have a large amount. And so, or, you know, potentially. So yeah, it's, it's not good. For sure. Yeah, it says 600,000 people are affected, revealing their wallet address, transaction histories, crypto mm -hmm. holdings, and recent. Ooh, that's bad. So it's very, very detailed. And, um, you know, another reason why decentralized crypto lenders or exchanges um, could be, you know, problematic. Yeah, for sure. Always right. educating people about that, but you know, <laughs> yeah, there's so much you can do. Um, next, I just have a couple educational nuggets here. Uh, the first one is this developing the DAO health survey, an open source tool for Web3 organizational effectiveness. I know DAOs, you know, especially this year and last year, have become very uh, big and important in a lot of people's. Um, workflows. And I think what's interesting, at least if you're in the blockchain space, of course, and this article is pretty good at explaining how to optimize your DAO community, specifically um, they talk about DAO health and what they're trying to do. Um, so I thought this was, I'm not going to go into the details here, but you know, the results in DAOs with the tendency to be high in temporal distribution teams are geographically temporally distributed. So it talks about like how it's different from a traditional organization and why you have to really consider designing it in a different way and, and helping foster your community in a different way. So um, yeah, this is a good article if anyone's interested. Also, this is, you know, discusses what measures you should keep in mind. So like KPIs basically for your DAOs. And yeah, it goes into great detail about this. So I just wanted to bring this to everyone's attention. Uh, and this was published on Talent Dow's blog. So, yeah, not going to go too much, but feel free to leave a comment if you think that's interesting. Uh, the next thing here is just a video. It's actually about two and a half hours long. I'm not going to play it, but it's about self sovereign identity. And you have uh, a bunch of demos, and one including. Uh, the CEO of Spherity, which has been working on, you know, self-sovereign identity for some time now. And it's pretty recent, I think less than a couple of weeks old, and it took place in the Netherlands. So if you're interested, check that out as well. It's free on YouTube. And that's all I had in terms of, you know, articles and interesting nuggets of information. But uh, Erica or anybody, do you have any additional things to share with the community? Um, I don't have any at this time, but thank you for sharing all that. That was super informative. Awesome. Yeah. If anybody in the watching this later on on YouTube has any questions or comments or any additional information you'd like to share with the rest of the community, feel free to, you know, post that in the comments and, you know, we take a look at it for sure. Um, thank you. Uh, is there anything else anybody wanted to share or discuss today? In that case, I'll stop sharing my screen and I'll end the recording.